All right, hello everyone. Hope everyone can hear me. Hope everyone's having a great day. Welcome. Uh, some of us are members of the Stony Brook Medicine Healthy Libraries Program, or HELP. We're excited today to talk about cardiovascular health and heart health and different ways uh, you can improve your heart health or maintain your heart health. And we're here for you guys. We're here for everyone joining us today. So we want to make sure that we're answering any questions you guys might have. Uh, so we encourage anyone joining us today, any participants, to send in the chat or unmute yourselves. Uh, let us know how you guys found about the Healthy Libraries program and the presentation today um, and anything you guys hope to get out of the presentation today or any questions you guys might have as well. So feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat. We'd love to hear from everyone. Okay, are we ready to get started? I think so. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Mary Ellen LaSalle and I am part of the Healthy Libraries program. I'd like to say welcome and um, talk a little bit about the Healthy Libraries program. So Stony Brook Medicine's Healthy Libraries program and the acronym is HELP is a partnership with the Public Libraries of Suffolk County, the Suffolk Collaborative Library System Outreach Services Department, and is supported in part by the American Heart Association of Long Island. This program is an interdisciplinary team of public health, nursing, and social work students whose aim is to provide evidence-based health information, screening, and case management to a diverse community of patrons in the public library setting. Also refer patients to pr promote access to appropriate health and social services programs locally that will address their health and social support needs. And lastly, for students to experience an interprofessional team and demonstrate the core competencies based on the Interprofessional Education Collaborative. Our student leaders, um, we'll, we'll introduce our, ourselves as we, we move forward, but Gwen Mercep is, under, is an undergrad student, Bachelor's of Science in Health Science. Philip Massaro, nursing student, Bachelor's of Science in Nursing. Winnie De Los Santos, she's also an undergrad student in social work, and Christine Weber, graduate student, Master of Social Work. And our faculty and staff leaders, we have Dr. Lisa Ben Scott. She is a professor and director of the public program in public health here at Stony Brook Medicine and Stony Brook University. My name is uh, Dr. Mary Ellen Lasala, and I am the chair of the Department of Undergraduate Studies, the School of Nursing. We also have Professor Maria Boone. She is a clinical professor, School of Nursing. And Leah Topek Walker, Social Worker, Field Education Coordinator, School of Social Welfare. And Jessica Cruz, she is our Health Science Librarian, School of Medicine, Public Health, and Biomedical Informatics. And last but not least, Gabriella Pandefelli. She's our graduate student, Master of Public Health. So I'm gonna ask the students to introduce themselves. Right now, Victoria. Hi everyone, I'm Victoria. I'm a senior nursing student here at Stony Brook University. Thank you, Victoria. All right. Hi, I'm Malia. I'm also a senior nursing student here at uh, Stony Brook. Great, I'm Malia. Michael. Michael, are you there? All right. Well, yes, I am. Um, okay, good, Michael. Go ahead. Yes, my my name is Michael Mahmoud Hussein, a uh, senior nursing student. Great. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Abby Marshall, I'm a senior nursing student. Rani, are you there? Uh, can you hear me? All right, now Ronnie is another nursing, uh, senior nursing student at Stony Brook School of Nursing. Thank you. And I'm Dr. Mary Ellen LaSalle, clinical assistant professor, undergraduate studies chair of the undergraduate studies. And it's so nice to meet everyone. 
And now I'd like to turn over to Philip, and he is going to walk us through the pre-webinar poll. Oh, hey, everyone. So we just have a few questions before we begin. Just a few items that I'm going to launch in a poll. So on your screen, it should pop up a pre-webinar poll with Zoom. Just a few questions about heart health. Uh, we want to see you know, how everyone's doing and knows about heart health uh, so we can continue on with the webinar. Um, if you have any issues, uh, just unmute yourself or put in the chat if you have any issues with accessing the poll. All right, I appreciate everyone who was able to access the poll. All right, I'm gonna close the poll now. And I'm gonna turn it back over to our presenters and we'll continue on with the webinar. Thank you, Philip. And now Professor Boone. Yes, hello everybody. Um, just going over some learning objectives for the session. So at the end of this presentation, the participants will be able to identify the risks for heart disease that can be changed, identify the types of cholesterol in the human body, identify what numbers of blood pressure are in the normal range, identify how often an adult should get his or her blood pressure checked, identify the difference in stroke signs between men and women, identify food to avoid on a heart healthy diet, and identify the minimum amount of time recommended for adults to be moderately active per week. And last but not least, identify what an A1C blood test can show. Again, just a quick reminder to please put yourself on mute. And if you would like to ask a question, please enter the questions into the chat and we will work to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. I will now um, introduce Michael, who will begin the presentation on car cardiovascular health. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael, like she said, and today I'm gonna to talk about uh, the importance of uh, heart you know, health for everyone. So I would like you to pay attention and uh, take note if you must, all right? Okay, next slide. Okay, so the question is, why is the heart health important? This is how we need to look at it. The heart is the generator and the power supply of the body. Like the computer without the power supply, nothing else works. The heart creates actual electrical impulses that run through your body, supplying energy and nutrients to your cells and removing waste product. Because your heart is crucial to your survival, it is important to keep it healthy with a well-balanced diet and exercise and avoid things that can cause damage to it. And then now we go back to the question, why is heart health important? And these are the following. Heart diseases are the leading causes of death in the United States. And keeping your heart health checked every time 
helps maintain healthy cholesterol and blood pressure. It helps reduce feelings of depression, lowest risk of developing uh, dementia, especially in elderly patients. So here, our motto here is save the heart, save a life. So when the heart stops beating, the body starts dying. That's why CPR is very important to, you know, important tool to use to make sure the generator of the body keeps supplying blood to the body. Next slide, please. So now we go to heart disease and what it is. There are a range of conditions that affect the heart and body in so many ways. Some heart diseases include coronary artery disease, arrhythmia, among others. Heart disease affect blood flow to the heart, which can lead to heart attack. And there are a lot of effects of heart disease on your body. And some of them include chest pain or discomfort, upper back, upper back or neck pain, indigestion or heart burn, nausea or vomiting, extreme fatigue, or upper body, discomfort, dizziness, and shortness of breath. Heart disease is actually a major public health problem that is dominated by death statistics in the last few decades and accounts for nearly half of non-communicable diseases across the globe. Next slide, please. So now it's important for us to look at the risk factors that you know, makes one uh, susceptible to heart diseases. And technically, there are two categories of risk factors that we're gonna talk about. One is modifiable factors. And when we say that, we're talking about those that you can uh, take measures to change them, all right? For example, exercise, lack of exercise. These are things that you can change. If you change it, it will greatly improve you from you know, uh, improving your heart health. Obesity your weight is very important for you to control your weight. That helps you to maintain a good heart health. And diet, what you eat is also a very important factor in determining your risk factor to heart diseases. And not to talk about you know, smoking, you know, tobacco use, and diabetes as well. Once you have these factors, it you know, puts you at risk to heart diseases. So these are modifiable factors that you can take measures to change so you don't even get the disease in the first place. And the second category is called non-modifiable factors. And when we talk about it, we're talking about those that you cannot change much because they are kind of fixed. You can't change them. For example, your age. A statistics shows that people you know, 65 and older are at higher risk of getting heart disease more than those that are below that age category. So when you get to a certain you know, age group, there's nothing much you can do to change that. That's why it's called non-modifiable. And when you come to race, it's another factor. Some races are actually susceptible to heart diseases. For example, African-Americans are more susceptible to heart disease than non-African-Americans. So if you are one of, you know, if you're an African-American, it's very important for you to pay attention to this kind of uh, symptoms and disease. And gender as well. If you're a female or male, males are more susceptible to, you know, heart disease than the females. And if you have a family history, that also, you know, acts as a non-modifiable factor. If you have a family history of heart diseases, it's very important to pay attention to such factors. Next slide, please. And now we go to uh, visiting your primary care provider. It is very important to visit your primary care provider or doctor or for a checkup. There's a, if there's a problem with your heart, the earlier your heart health care provider picks up on it, the earlier you can get treated and prevent your heart condition from getting worse. Your healthcare provider will check your blood pressure in the offices. So it's very important to visit them to get that checked. You can use an electrocardiogram test to measure your heart's electrical activity and see the conditions of your heart. 
your healthcare provider will help you, you know, to a specialist to get them, to get you more tests if needed. Remember, prevention is always better than cure. Next slide, please. Now we'll go to uh, cholesterol. We hear this word a lot of time, and now we have to find out what that is. Cholesterol essentially is a waxy substance that circulates in the blood to perform vital functions in the body. As your cholesterol level in your body increases, so does the risk to your heart health. High cholesterol is one of the major controllable risk factors for smoke, for stroke and heart attack. Risk factors such as smoking, diabetes, and high blood pressure can contribute to heart diseases. And so this cholesterol that we're talking about, essentially there are two you know, sources of cholesterol. One that is produced by your own body, the liver, and one that is also derived from food that we eat, especially animal products like uh, poultry, meat, and dietary products. So these are the you know, sources of cholesterol that we have. And we have two types of cholesterol. And here we're gonna you know, uh, categorize them as good and bad cholesterol. Good cholesterol is called essentially a high density lipoprotein or HDL. And what it does is it lowers risk for heart disease. And the bad cholesterol uh, is called low density lipoprotein, LDL. And what it does is it increases risk for heart disease. So this cholesterol are essential in the body, but they need to be, you know, in the right amount to, you know, function properly in your, in your, in your body. So that's why we need to check, make sure uh, we have the right amount of cholesterol to control, to play the vital functions that they do in our body. And now, how do you know uh, your cholesterol level is high or low? So there are criteria that we use. So if you have, uh, Greater than, uh, greater than or equal to 60 uh, milligram per deciliter for uh, good cholesterol. And bad cholesterol essentially should be less than 100 milligram per deciliter. So you have to, you know, technically under understand these numbers and make sure it doesn't go above or below certain, you know, uh, range. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now, how should I lower my cholesterol? Well, that's a very important question because we just talked about what cholesterol can do to the body. Routine exercise can lower your cholesterol. So it's very important to exercise and uh, uh, lower your cholesterol. You do not have to go to a gym to exercise. You can practice some uh, new dance moves or just move around to music. Eat low sodium food make sure to take your prescribed high you know, blood medications. And uh, if you need further information about this thing, there's a link below you can definitely utilize and get more information about this uh, information, uh, cholesterol. Next slide, please. And the blood pressure is another thing we're going to talk about related to heart disease. Understanding your blood pressure is vital. The first number, normally you have two numbers. The first number in a blood pressure reading shows your, the, your, the amount of pressure that your blood puts in your heart artery, artery wall when the heart beats. Every time the heart beats, then you have that you know, number, you know, uh, that measurement, which is called uh, systole, systolic number, all right? And the second number represents the amount of pressure that your uh, blood puts on your artery walls in between beats and your heart is, and when your right uh, heart is resting. And that's called diastolic you know, number. In general, your blood pressure should be under 120 over 80. That's the you know, guideline. A high blood pressure would be over 140 over 90. This baseline is very important to understand that the values can change depending on other health problems you may have. A high blood pressure can lead to heart attack, stroke, heart failure, and vision problems as well. Next slide, please. All right, so continuation of blood pressure. People 
uh, people 40 years and all that high risk for high blood pressure and should get their blood pressure checked every year. People between 18 and 40 uh, years should get their blood pressure checked every three to four years. You can go to a healthcare provider office or to a pharmacy for a blood pressure check. You can use your own blood pressure machine to monitor your uh, blood pressure as well, just to give you a guideline as to where you stand with the numbers that we just talked about. And that will end my slide for uh, now. All right, we will hear now from Ar Arani, who will continue on with the presentation. Uh, hello. How does heart disease lead to the development of a stroke? Many heart disorders can increase your chances of developing a stroke. One heart condition that increases your chances of developing a stroke is coronary artery, artery disease, also known as CAD. Coronary artery disease, or CAD, leads to the build of a plaque within your arteries, which obstructs the flow of blood to the brain. A lack of blood flow to the brain leads to cerebral hypoxia, which in return results in a stroke. Cerebral hypoxia is the fancy term of saying there's a decrease of blood or oxygen to the brain. Next slide, please. Let's talk about how the warning signs of a stroke differ in both men and women. Next slide, please. Signs of stroke in men and women. Number one, numbness or weakness. That can be found in your face, arm, or legs. Trouble speaking or understanding speech, vision problems, trouble walking or lack of coordination, and severe headaches with no known cause. Additional signs in women, um, in addition to women having the symptoms on the left, they've also been found to have these symptoms. One, general weakness. Two, confusion, memory problems, disorientation. Three, fatigue. And four, nausea or vomiting. What can I do to take care of myself? We will be discussing what you can do to keep your heart healthy and happy. Nutrition, exercise, alcohol consumption, the effects of smoking, stress management, diabetes management, and sleep. Nutrition, um, this is about BMI and weight. Everyone should keep track of their BMI, otherwise known as your body mass index. Your BMI uses your weight and your height to put you into one of these categories, underweight, healthy weight, overweight, and obesity. Being overweight or obese increases your risk of developing heart disease, having strokes, or having high blood pressure. If your BMI is not within normal limits, you should go to your health healthcare provider to discuss this. You can find an adult BMI calculator here at the cbc.gov slash healthy website. Uh, nutrition continuing, healthy diets. Your heart will benefit from eating whole grain, such as whole wheat flour, oatmeal, or high fiber cereals. You should try to increase the amount of vegetables and fruits you eat. Try to eat fresh or frozen fruits and vegetables. Try to keep track of how much you're eating and try to follow the serving sizes on packaged foods. Eat food with low, pro sorry, low protein levels like eggs, fish, or legumes, beans, peas, chickpeas. To keep, a, to keep a healthy heart, you should eat a variety of foods in your diet. Plan your meals ahead of time. If you're eating healthy, you can enjoy a treat every now and then. It's all about moderation. Next slide, please. Nutrition continuing. Uh, now we're gonna talk about unhealthy diets. Try to stay away from foods with trans fats like packaged cookies or chips. Limit saturated fat and limit intake of bacon, butter, or gravy. Avoid foods high in sodium or salt. Do not add extra salt to your food when you're eating a cooked meal. You should limit canned soups, ketchup, and pre-made frozen dinners. You should eat more fruits and vegetables to maintain your heart's health, but you should not eat too many coconuts, canned foods with heavy syrup, or fried vegetables. Next slide, please. Physical activity. Physical activity lowers your risk of coronary heart disease in a number of ways. One, it can lower your blood pressure. Two, it can raise your HDLs, otherwise known as your good cholesterol. 
Three, when combined with good nutrition, it can help you lose weight. Four, it can lower your risk for type two diabetes. Five, there's many other ways. Next slide, please. Physical activity, continuing on it. The CDC states that the average adult should be getting around 150 minutes of at least moderate physical activity a week, about 30 minutes a day. Physical activity is anything that gets your heart pumping faster. Moderate physical activity could be, an easy, could be as easy as going for a brisk walk or pushing a lawnmower. It's possible to work physical exercise into your daily routine as well by doing things like parking further away from the store or taking the stairs, not the elevator. While, in the de while it is ideal for adults to be as active as possible, any physical activity is good. You can start out with simple activities and build up your endurance. Check with your doctor before making any big changes to your physical activity. Oh, these are. Now I'm gonna be handing this over to Malia. Hi everyone. The CDC also recommends that adults do muscle building activities at least two days a week. This includes things like weightlifting, heavy gardening, and some forms of yoga. For more information, you can go to cdc.gov slash physical activity slash basics. Next slide, please. You can also limit your alcohol intake. A healthy amount of alcohol is two drinks per day for men and one drink a day for women. In addition to putting you at risk for alcohol poisoning, irregular heartbeat, and high blood pressure, drinking too much alcohol can put you at risk for alcohol, oh, <laughs> can lead to the buildup of plaque in the arteries that causes coronary artery disease. Next slide, please. You can also limit smoking and tobacco. Smoking and tobacco products increase your risk for coronary heart disease by damaging your blood vessels and raising your blood pressure. This is a diagram of a cigarette and all of the dangerous chemicals it contains. Um, as you can see, there are things like methanol, which is used in rocket fuel, and uh, stearic acid, which is in candle wax. Next slide, please. You can also uh, take care of your heart by managing your stress. Excess stress can increase your blood pressure, which can increase your risk of heart disease. It can also lead you to pursue less healthy habits, such as consumption of alcohol, smoking, and overeating to cope. Ways you can limit your stress include exercising, limiting your caffeine intake, eating healthy, taking walks in nature, learning relaxation techniques, and taking time to engage in your favorite hobby. Next slide. And now I'll be passing it off to Victoria. Hi everyone. So I'm gonna be talking about the link between diabetes and heart disease. Diabetes increases your chances of developing heart disease. Having high levels of blood glucose over a long period of time can lead to damage in not only your blood vessels, but the nerves that control your heart as well. In someone without diabetes, the body's tissues usually use sugar as an energy source. It is then stored in your liver as a form of glycogen. If you have diabetes, sugar remains within your bloodstream, leading to blood vessel and nerve damage. This damage can lead to the inflammation, narrowing, and the clogging of your blood vessels. Next slide, please. So the link between diabetes and heart disease continued. If you have diabetes, it is extremely important to monitor your blood sugar. It's also important to note to always keep a record of your blood sugar. Each time you go to your healthcare provider, be sure to show them your blood sugar level record. Those who have diabetes are more likely to develop heart disease at a younger age than those who do not have diabetes. Adults with diabetes are two times more likely to die from heart disease than those without diabetes. Also on this slide, you see the picture on the right hand corner. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that picture. So, these are three blood vessels. You can see the blood vessel on the left is very open, which means it's easier for blood to pass through it. The middle vessel has some damage with the buildup of fatty material. This vessel is still for the most part open, but you begin to see some occlusion occurring. The vessel all the way on the right hand side is completely occluded, well almost completely occluded. The vessel on the right only has a small hole for blood to pass through, leading to a reduced blood flow. Next slide, please. 
Preventing heart disease and diabetes. Do you live with diabetes and want to know of ways to reduce your risk of ang and heart disease, or maybe your spouse, neighbor, or parent does? We'll continue to the next slide and we'll discuss. The National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases recommends the ABCs in managing your diabetes and preventing heart disease. So on the right hand side, I have the a, B, C spelled out, and it just talks about the A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol, and stop smoking, which I'm going to go all in depth about this on the next slide. So A1C test. This test shows you your average blood glucose level over the course of three months. For diabetic patients, this number should be below 7%. Cholesterol. As Michael was talking about a little bit earlier in the presentation, I'm just going to add on to it. So you want a low LDL level in your blood, which is the bad cholesterol. Too much LDL or bad cholesterol in your blood can lead to blockages within your blood vessel. Ask your doctor what your cholesterol level should be. Helpful tip in remembering LDL is that the L in LDL stands for low. Next slide, please. Blood pressure. The goal of blood pressure for many people with diabetes should be below 140 over 90. Smoking. Diabetes narrows your blood vessels and so does smoking. If you have diabetes and you smoke, this means that your blood vessels are at risk for getting even more narrow. If your blood vessels are narrow, they won't be able to hold a lot of blood, and there will be a lot of resistance that the heart has to overcome to push the blood out and get it to our important and vital organs. Next slide, please. How does sleep affect your heart health? Most adults need at least seven hours of sleep each night. One in three Americans say they do not receive the recommended amount of sleep each night. Consistently not getting enough sleep can lead to serious health problems and make current health problems worse. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Adults who sleep less than seven hours each night may have health problems. Many of these problems are problems that we have already discussed and are major contributors to heart disease. So like we were saying, high blood pressure. While you're sleeping, your blood pressure will decrease. If you have trouble sleeping, your blood pressure stays higher for a longer period of time. Type 2 diabetes. Some studies show that getting enough sleep may contribute to improving your blood sugar. Obesity. Not getting enough sleep can lead to weight gain, since sleep may influence the portion of the brain that controls hunger. This presentation went in depth in talking about the importance of heart health. There are many factors that contribute to the development of heart diseases, such as having high levels of cholesterol and high blood pressure. We discussed the following, warning signs of a stroke, importance of a healthy diet, and what a healthy diet is. Comorbidities that increase your risk of heart disease, such as diabetes. We hope that you not only enjoyed our presentation and gained knowledge that you can now apply to your health in regard to keeping your heart healthy. So right here, we have a list of phone numbers and national helpline resources. Um, things like the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, National Child Abuse Hotline, National Sexual Assault Hotline, Suicide Prevention, and um, the National Domestic Violence. And here's some more national helpline resources from things like Suffolk County Crisis Response, the Crisis Residence, Domestic Violence, and CPEP program at Stony Brook. And a continuum of local hotline resources. So we have the APS, which is Adult Protective Services, CPS, Child Protective Services, just to name a few. So we have um, different links on the slide for you guys that are in regards to Stony Brook Medicine's Healthy Libraries program. So we have our YouTube link, um, we have a Facebook page, which you can go visit if you guys have a Facebook and you can give us a like and you can find a lot of information there and you can find our videos as well. We have a website and an email, which is healthy libraries program at stonybrookmedicine.edu. Now I'm going to hand it over to Phil and he is going to talk about the post webinar pool. Hi everyone. Hope you guys enjoyed the webinar. Hopefully, you're able to understand some and uh, gain some better information about heart disease and some ways to stay heart healthy. So at this time, I 
I'm go I just shared the poll with everyone. And hopefully the poll pops up on your screen or the device that you are using. And I ask everyone, if you guys don't mind, just to complete the poll and we'll give everyone a minute to get that done. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you guys so much for completing that poll. So at this time, we're gonna open up the floor to some questions. If you guys have any, feel free to unmute yourself and you guys can ask your questions or you guys feel better, you guys can put them in the chat as well. And we'll definitely work to answer any questions you guys have related to heart disease, heart health, um, and really any other questions you guys might have about health or any questions you guys might uh, have in general. We're here for you guys, so any questions you guys have, definitely feel free to chime in and let us know. Bill, um, I was unable to complete the survey because it froze. That's number one. And number two is, um, I wonder if you could uh, put back the warning signs of the strokes for men and women. It was so fast that I couldn't write it down. Absolutely, I'm sorry about the poll. Uh, no worries though. And we'll definitely go back to that slide. And Thank just you so to, much. Absolutely. And just to let everyone know these, the presentation, the slide, and the recording of the slide will be available uh, this evening starting on our YouTube page as well. So you can definitely take a look at that. Okay, that's it. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Can I ask a question for clarification about the signs and symptoms of a heart attack and stroke? Sure. Um, is it true or false that the, the pain and the weakness in the case of a stroke, weakness in the case of a heart attack pain is always on the left side where your heart is. Is that true or not true? Who would like to answer that? Or would I feel tightness in my neck? Yes. I was having a heart right. attack, it, not just on my left arm. I know right. there's a lot of folks that think it's just yes. pain in your left arm. No. So it can could you speak be. to what that pain or weakness differentiating between heart attack and stroke might feel like? Thank you. Well, I, I just like to say that, um, no, it's not just on the left side. It could be um, in your back. It could be in your jaw. It could be on the right side. It could be in the left side of the chest, right side of the chest. Um, individuals have different symptoms. So anytime that you might be feeling, um, you know, it could be just severe fatigue. Some people don't have any, um, pain at all. And they go to the doctor and they, they get their uh, an EKG done and they said, wow, 
you had have you had an uh, um, a heart attack and myocardial infarction in the past and the patient never knew it. So it doesn't have to only be on the left side. Would anybody else like to add to that? Students? Yeah. Um, you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> if you have um, a... Uh, I if you have a pain in your jaw and um, it hurts when you move it, then that doesn't necessarily mean like it's a heart attack. That can mean that you have um, a problem with the muscles. But if it hurts um, consistently and constantly, then that could be an indicator um, of it being a heart problem. That goes with um, all things, face, arm, leg. You can go, Victoria. Um, I would, yeah, I was just going to add on to what um, Dr. LaSalle said. Um, and also, there have been incidences where patients will say that they have, because obviously with a heart attack, everyone talks about the left side, but there's actually been incidences where patients have had um, pain on their right arm only and not the left arm. And also, you can have substernal pain. Um, pain radiates, which obviously radiates to the jaw and the neck as well. I was just going to add on to that. Well, in addition to what you guys said, I think uh, every time you have a pain, uh, especially unusual pain, is very critical that you uh, go for a checkup, you know, go to your doctor, make sure everything is okay. Uh, don't just sit down and you know diagnose yourself that or oh, this pain might be heart attack or this pain might be a stroke or something like that. If you have unusual pain, left or right, it's critical that you follow up with your doctor and make sure uh, everything is okay. The I, the goal is in the prevention is always better than cure. Get it checked as early as possible and address it as quickly as possible as well. Thank you. Thank you, Arani, for that um, resource that you just put in the in the chat box. No problem. Well, thank you, everyone. We also have a great question in the chat. If someone can find the answer, we have: Does Stony Brook have any preventative clinics or nutritional classes available? So, possibly in the outpatient clinics and nutritional classes. Okay. Is someone, can someone look that up? I could tell you that the hospital does have nutrition classes. I'm trying to look it up right now. And I'm not finding anything. Can, um... There is, um, it looks like Stony Brook does have the Heart Institute, which uh, if you go to their website, you can like fill out a risk assessment based off of your lifestyle. And then if you wanted to meet with a cardiologist to discuss um, preventative care you could. Um, there's also a woman's heart center, but it doesn't look like there's any mention of like um, preventative clinics happening currently. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as Dr. Ben Scott mentioned, there's registered dietitians at Stony Brook, and they can also yes. help um, if you're looking for a certain diet. And you could also call the hospital, Stony Brook um, Medicine, the hospital, 
and ask the, the switchboard if they know of any classes that will be taking care of any preventative or nutritional um, classes. Sometimes when you walk around the hospital, they have uh, flyers saying when the next um, you know, class will be on nutrition or stroke or cardiac disease. So there, there definitely is classes in the hospital, but I'm not, it's not showing up for me. Um, I've attached a number for Stony Brook's primary care um, facility. Okay. Um, the number is 631-751-9700. I can repeat that, and it's also in the chat. Yeah, it also looks like the Stony Brook Heart Institute does have some community events. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if they're still going on because of COVID, but they do health screenings and um, as well as vascular screenings. Um, but it looks like currently you would have to call um, numbers if you wanted to get a health or vascular screening. You would have to schedule an appointment. Um. Yes, and I just want to mention to everyone that if you have questions or if you want us to help you further, we definitely recommend that you can give us a call at the phone number on your screen right here to the Healthy Libraries program, which is 631-216-8220. And you can email us as well at healthy underscore, or that small line underneath, so healthy underscore libraries underscore program at stonyworkmedicine.edu. So we definitely give us an email or you can message one of us in the chat and send us your email and we will absolutely send you these resources or help you further and get in contact with the registered dietitians regarding nutrition, any social workers as well. We can uh, help you schedule appointments with a primary care provider and help you move forward in, uh, in your health any way that we can. So again, give us a call at the phone number 631-216-8220 or email us at healthy underscore libraries underscore program at stonyworkmedicine.edu. I believe JH um, had a question in the chat. JA asked, what was the first speaker, which I believe that was Michael was referring to about heart health, depression and dementia? Michael, did you talk about that in your slide earlier? Yes, I did. So JH was asking that question. I'm sorry, what's the question again, if you don't mind? What, was, what were you referring to about heart health and depression and dementia? Yes, I was talking about uh, the heart disease, the effect of heart disease on your overall well-being, overall well, uh, in, uh, well-being. That includes a uh, 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 lowest risk of developing dementia, especially in elderly in a patient. Uh, research has shown that uh, if you don't, if you have, you know, unhealthy heart condition, the, the supply, your blood supply in your entire system get affected you know indirectly or indirectly so those indirect effects could include dementia early dementia you know especially elderly you know patients and people with uh, underlying conditions as well okay did that answer your question Okay. Any other questions? The time is it's two fifty six. Okay.
Michael, did you see that? I guess JH is saying, I guess higher risk of those with heart disease. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, if there are no other questions, anyone else have any thoughts or comments? Um, these are just some possible questions that you might have had. Right. had. Um, how can I work out to keep my heart healthy if all the gyms are closed during this pandemic? We know it's hard. Um, gyms are opening up with social distancing and appointments. Um, you can work out at home to YouTube videos. There's a lot of YouTube videos on working out without equipment, so it's cost effective and you're in the comfort of your own home. And just dancing at home is a workout. You'll burn something. Next slide, please. Why does my weight or BMI affect my heart? Having a higher BMI is correlated with having more heart-related health problems. Um, this doesn't mean having a higher BMI means you will have heart problems, but there seems to be a relationship between it. Um, and over here is a little infograph of, um, you know, monitor steps to regulate um, your BMI and heart health. Uh, live smoke-free, watch your cholesterol, get active, and eat a heart-healthy diet are some of them. And I, that's it for uh, this presentation. If you have any more questions, let us know. Or contact the number or uh, email here.